Welcome to Podcast 83, a regular look at the news, stories, and trends related to Michigan's 83 counties. From Keweenaw to Monroe, Chippewa to Berrien, brought to you by the Michigan Association of Counties. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, Welcome to Podcast 83, podcast put on by the Michigan Association of Counties. I am Dina Bosworth, and I'm sitting in for Steve Curry, who normally starts our podcasts, but he's not with us today. Um, and instead, today I have with me Eric Lufer from the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. And Eric is the president of CRC and has been there, oh my goodness, Eric, how many years have you been there? 34 years now. Okay, 34 years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Citizens Research Council does a lot of um, research and publishing of their research and blog writing on government. Am I correct? Like efficient government, tax policy, economic development policy, sort of what, why don't you tell me a little bit more about CRC and, and, and tell our listeners a little bit more. Yeah, so I've been 34 years. The organization itself is 105 years old now and was created with the idea that better information leads to better government. So when you're gonna buy a car, you go on car and driver and you do your research on which bells and whistles you like best. We need that information for local government, for state government, for school districts, for the policymakers to have the information they need to make sound decisions. And our organization was created not to push a progressive agenda or libertarian agenda or anything else, but to drive straight down the middle, find the facts and get them to policymakers so they can, uh, you know, take that and and they're going to have their own political philosophy, Republican, Democrat, Green, Libertarian, whatever, uh, take that good information, but let's agree on the information and Mm -hmm. use that to make uh, decisions. So we look at... We yeah, look at a nonprofit, right? You're a nonprofit mm-hmm. and you're governed by a board. I know Steve Curry, our executive director, sits on your board. So right. then you just have influence. Your board is made up of how many people? How many? Uh, how many it's people? it's a maximum of 35. We're at 33 right now. They're lawyers, they're bankers, they're uh, business people, some inside government. We have MAC and the MTA, uh, inside government, and most of them are outside government that care about good public policy and, and want us to do the things we're doing. Well, that sounds like a really good balanced board. That's, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So Eric, why don't you talk a little bit about, I, I know I, you've done several blogs and some articles for us in the past, um, and you've even done, done research that is really of interest to, to counties. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about that? I just saw your most recent one. The talk is about county revenue sharing shift as a gimmick. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Why don't you tell everybody about that? Yeah. um, So the idea we want to do is get information out to help uh, our current legislators, but also uh, the turnover and county officials to understand something that was done now 17 years ago and how it continues to affect county government and state finances with term limits at the state level, with the regular turnover of county officials, that's all lost information. So what happened uh, back in 2004, you recall, this is what we call now our lost decade with state finances were at their their worst really in recent time. And the state was trying, you know, I I use the analogy reaching between the couch cushions looking for spare change uh, in the context of a state budget a billion dollars to spare change sometimes. Uh, so, so they were trying to figure out how to continue to do all the things that the state was doing, but where do you, you know, cut a few corners and save a few bucks? And the idea they came up with was to shift the county property tax levy, uh, help me if I get this wrong, from the winter to the summer, right? And, they accelerated the collection, right? right. Yeah. Well, the, 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 by, by doing that shift, it was able to accelerate the collection and use that accelerated amount beyond what they needed uh, for their current fiscal year to put that in the bank 
and in lieu of state revenue sharing, tap into that money that they put in the bank. Uh, so they continue to call it county revenue sharing. They continue to tell the counties how much they could pull out of the bank on a year to year basis. But it ranks up there as the mother of all gimmicks with several others that have been done over the years. To, to me, the greatest one was still moving the state fiscal year from uh, the end of June to the end of September. You now had a 15 month year and you could do crazy things to fix your budget if you just put a few more months into it. So that one's the best of all that I've heard of, but this is a close second. Well, now we're sitting on a ton, of, I shouldn't say this, but revenues are up, correct? Yes. State revenues are up right now. So not only general fund revenue is up, but then we have this huge influx of federal dollars. Why don't you kind of talk about what that looks like? I mean, we haven't seen this kind of revenue in a long, long time, have we? No, it's, it's funny how the dynamics are the same. When money is tight, everybody's fighting to protect their own. And now we have excess money and everybody's fighting because they want a piece of it. Um, so we got the ARPA money coming in, the American Rescue Plan from the uh, beginning of the Biden administration. Uh, the state has, has a wealth of money. They got money through the CARES Act and other money that came in last year in the midst of the pandemic. I term that money stability money, right? It wasn't about how do you grow the economy, but how do you make sure that the states have everything they need to continue doing what they should be doing so the economy doesn't fall apart. By the time the Biden administration took over and they did this American Rescue Plan, the winds had shifted and it's really now about stimulating the economy, getting us back to where we thought we would be had there not been a pandemic. Everybody gets some money. It's, it's like the Oprah Winfrey show on steroids. You get a car and you get a car and, and you get money and you get money. And then so, you know, it's going to hospitals, it's going to public health departments and everything else. It's going to state government, it's going to local governments, it's going to school districts. Uh, there's a, a boatload of money, about $6 billion in total coming to the state and local governments. Um, I think I'm, I'm lowballing that. I um, think you are. I think it's like six and a half billion to the state, but right. I know counties get like 1.9 yeah. billion. Right, it's about four and a half to local governments, yeah. counties, cities, and, yeah. and townships. Uh, so the deal is that they there's some restrictions. They're not supposed to use it to pay down debt. They're not supposed to use it to uh, put in, you know, just put in the bank to put in the rainy day funds. It says they're supposed to use it for um, water and sewer or, or a few other things to shore up finances if you have lost revenue from, mm -hmm. from things. But the way it's been, uh, the rules around it are pretty lenient. So you can use it just about any way you want. It's not like that Voya commercial where you have green money and orange money and the, the feds are gonna be checking which color money did you use to pay for these things. If you can verify that your revenue hasn't, your revenues aren't growing at a 4% rate over the next couple of years, then they consider that lost revenue because of the pandemic and you have a lot of freedom to use that any way you want. Um, we think with the state government, almost 90% of all the revenue the state is getting, it can use any way it wants. And so everyone is, you know, this isn't just the, the water and sewer lobby coming in saying we want that money and, and we're going to fix all these. Um, everybody's put their hands up and say, us, us, give us the money. Uh, with the local governments, it's pretty much the same thing our property taxes aren't growing that fast. We got a great real estate market, but the tax limitations are gonna put tamp the brakes on that a little bit. Um, so local governments are gonna have a lot of freedom. The trick is to invest in your community without creating a fiscal cliff, because it's a finite amount of money 
and, and that's a great term that fiscal cliff is a really good is really good term to use right. we've been talking about that for quite some time i mean how do you take this money really invest it in something that is and and i steal the words from dave masteron all the time but um you know how do you make this transformation what do, what do you do with it what can you invest it in um, and just so you know, Eric, and we've talked about this a little bit before on our podcast too, we've worked with MML and really put together a proposal where we're asking the state to put up close to $4 billion of their revenue to help match our revenue to make significant investments in our counties, in our cities, in our townships, in our communities, whether it be for water and sewer, lead line replacement, broadband, um, housing and community and economic development, social districts and parks and public health. I mean, you know, clearly it's going to be up to everybody what their priorities are, but how do we best invest it without saying, oh, well, now we just have this unrestricted, you know, pot of money and we're going to kind of go wild and crazy with it. Yeah, I think that's a great idea that at the county level, you have the ability to partner with your cities and townships. And at the state level, the ability to partner with the local governments and the school districts to get a bigger bang for the buck for these dollars, to, to braid them together um, to, to accomplish a lot of things. So uh, I'm hoping, you know, I'm down here on Livonia, so I'm thinking a lot about Detroit. You have the city and the school district overlapping. If they were to put their money together and think about the broadband issues in the city that were you know, a, a bright line, a light shone on that during the pandemic, the, the deficiencies. And how else can that play in other parts of the state to really, what did we learn about what our needs are, our childcare needs, our, you know, the things you ticked off parks and housing and things like that, and make a sound investment, knowing that that money's finite. It's not gonna be there forever. At 2004, we're gonna have to take whatever we've done in, over the last, these few years and make it work, make it be able to sustain it um, and, and use it to our best. Yeah. I mean, there has been such a, a you know a systematic disinvestment in local government, or at least, okay, so I represent county government. So I may be a little bit biased, but I do believe that the state has has made this, you know, systematic disinvestment in local government where yeah. Every dollar we're fighting each other for, and and trying to figure out how to make ends meet with as little amount of money as possible, which means we're not investing in our communities the way that we should be. We're you know, not. We don't have the resources. You know, Dina. The sad part is, it's not just local governments. It is pretty much everything that government does in Michigan has just floated along without growing since 2000, and we're talking now 20. 2001, so 20 years. So we're, we're not investing in any major way in our education system. Our higher education system isn't growing. Uh, the local governments, you can just tick off one thing by thing by thing. And we've done enough to keep these governments, these elements of government afloat without shutting off the lights and closing the doors, but they're not doing what we need to do to attract people and businesses and be a 21st century place where people want to be. And how far are we under the Headley cap? Can it to explain the Headley cap to everybody? And then how far under how, how far under are we? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, so the, the Headley cap, the when we say Headley, it's the Headley Amendment from 1978 that put tax limitations on our state and local governments. For the state government, it was a, a it pegged the amount of state revenue to personal income and said from, from that point, 1979 forward, that the state revenues can only grow at the same rate that personal income does. So uh, in 1994, when we had the, the proposal A and the shift, there was a, a rejiggering of, of that a little bit. Um, but we are now about, $12 billion, we could double the size of our general fund and still be below the Headley Amendment, uh, the, that limit for state government. Um, and when was the last time we were at that limit? It, yeah, it was um, 94, 95, when there was a bump up of the revenue 
um, okay. because of all that new money coming in with the tax shift. I thought we were really close when Engler was governor, were we not? Uh, yeah, we were. Yeah, I mean, but it was all remnants of that proposal A shift. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I, at one point, it was 98 or 99, we actually sent money back to every household. 60 bucks yeah. a piece or something like that. I remember what it was, but they, they under the provisions of the amendment, they yeah. had to the refund money to, to everyone. But but ever since then, uh, personal income has been growing at a slow rate, right? We're not even doing as well as the nation. And our state revenues are so much below it that we could we could do twice what we're already doing and still be below that limit. So I'm going to switch gears on you in just a little bit, Eric, and there was something else I wanted to ask you, but you did a recent blog on, and, and I think we published this in our newsletter too, but it was building a better county tax system. Do you want to talk about, you know, kind of what you wrote in there and what your message was there? Yeah, so part of what I've been harping on for all my 34 years is that Michigan local government is so tied to the property tax system that it's almost dysfunctional. That whether you're a, a township, a village, a city, a special, uh, special authority district, a county government, pretty much all you have to fund your, uh, your operations is the property tax. So we have 24 cities having income tax and counties have some real estate transfer tax and things like that. So, but, but those are just rounding error in the big picture of where the, these local governments get their money. And the point of our blog was to say, there are other options out there that could be used in a balanced way uh, to, to be a source of revenue, to reflect good things that are happening in our counties. And, and at the same time, use the property tax. So we're not gonna shift completely from one to the other, but it would reward the counties when they are able to attract business or it would attract, uh, reward the counties. Some of our Northern counties that have this time of year, all the tourists coming up and spending money. Uh, so they would benefit from a sales tax or they would benefit from an income tax. So the problem is again, going back to the Headley Amendment, that um, starting in 1978, the people in the county get the vote on any tax increase or new tax that want, that's being proposed. And it's sort of a, a, a game of chicken, who goes first, right? I don't wanna be the first to impose a, a county income tax or a county sales tax, lest all of the businesses leave my county for some place where they don't have to worry about that or all the shoppers shop outside the county where they don't have to pay that extra tax. So really what makes sense given the system that we've created is to go back to, uh, to where we started thinking about county revenue sharing and fund it in a meaningful way um, to, to levy a tax, a state tax on behalf of counties, whether that's the sales or the income, we can figure that out but to share it with the local governments and either send it back on the proportion that they're, they collected it or distribute it in a way that equalizes the fiscal capacity of those counties. So, um, you know, sort of as we, where we started, that requires, first of all, state officials recognizing the value of our local governments that without the counties, without the cities and the townships, the state is nothing you guys are the home to everyone. There, there's no place in Michigan where you're not in a county. So let's fund our counties um, to, to do it and to do it in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, this is one of the sore spots of term limits that uh, the people who we elect to our legislature don't have that vision of how everything works they don't stick around long enough to get that vision and none of them get elected. You know, often they have a platform, they, they wanna get into the legislature and fix something. I've not yet met one that wants to get in there and fix how we're funding county government. Right. So, I mean, I will say we have some that, you know, talk about it and that recognize the problems that we have. 
but really they are in the minority. So right. you know, not necessarily minority party, but minority in really pushing for local government finance reform and understanding that the better they fund local units of government and counties in particular, the better our communities are gonna be. And the more, you know, comprehensive and, and, and functional our services can be. I, we are faced all the time with legislation that gives property tax exemptions to every potential interest group just because they do good work. Well, again, you're further eroding the cap capability of local governments to do their job. Um, talking about revenue sharing, you're right. We're struggling every single year just to fight for the bare minimum. And that whole county revenue sharing gimmick don't get me started. <laughs> well, just because those counties that exhausted that reserve fund early are, are, are without about $115 million they were supposed to have. And, and whenever they came back onto the system, that's considered their full funding. So if they came back on that system, Eric, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that's still, that flat dollar amount is what their full funding is. And there's no, no, no accommodation for inflation or any of those things so yeah, yeah. And, and the real crime of that, the real <laughs> crime of that is that the first counties to come back were the property poor counties mm -hmm. that the amount of money they were getting from revenue sharing um, relative to their property tax base left them with very little money in that bank that i talked about that they can tap into so we're telling the poorest communities, uh, you're, the system is stacked against you. And, and the ones that are left, Emmett, um, Leland Al Counties, or Leland Al County just ended. Emmett is the last one that'll uh, phase out in the next couple of years. They're property rich counties and they're doing okay with or without the county revenue sharing. They, they're gonna hate for me to say this, but they're gonna be fine. They're good. Yeah, they're not very happy. They are not very happy about paying themselves and being the only one. No, they shouldn't be. Pay themselves forever. So, yeah, you, we can I, work I, out I a whole lot of analogies on, on how screwed up that system is. <laughs> oh well, Eric, we're getting we're getting um kind of winding down here in in the amount of time that we have for our podcast. Why don't you just talk a little bit about um maybe where you're going here with research projects? You want to give us a little insight into what you're working on? Yeah, I think the one that's going to be the most interest, we are um, hit, nearing the finish line on a look at Michigan's property tax limitations. The Section 31 limitation created by the Headley Amendment and the Proposal A taxable value system. And uh, again, we are finding that uh, this, the system is stacked against the communities with the least. Uh, so our, any community that is pretty much built out, so you can think about the inner ring suburbs of Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Grand Rapids area, the, those six or seven communities that make up that metropolitan Grand Rapids area. Um, if you don't have development, and if you don't have room for development, there's not much you can do, then you're really constrained with our current tax limitations on how much money you're going to have. It's a result of uh, when the Headley Amendment was put in, we have what we call tax rate rollbacks, that if the property tax base grows faster than the rate of inflation, you notch back the tax rate. Before 1993, you could also roll it up. So this great recession that we had, 10 years ago, we would have had an adjustment through that and the local go communities would have not done great, but they would have done better than they did. Um, but without that ability to, to roll up, uh, the communities were hurt. And then- um, The limit, if you don't have growth, you're really hurting. Right, yeah. Like, like it, new, new growth, correct? New, At new least growth, that's right. my layman's understanding of how it all works, that if you're a landlocked city, you don't really have much room to grow. No. So you're you're able to you know increase how much you can take in if you're say you know have lots of green space that you can put new buildings, new office buildings, new subdivisions, new whatever. Then you have the ability. You're not you're not penalized as much, correct? 
so, so it's a system that encourages urban sprawl and that's just not sustainable. It's not good for us as a state. It's not good for the environment. It's, it's not good in so many different ways. So yeah, we're, we're putting the finishing touches on that. We're hoping that that helps our legislators understand why the system isn't working and, and can better um, look at those numbers and, and think about what can be done to fix that. Well, whether that is, yeah, whether that's an alternative revenue sources or uh, fixing those limitations or, or mm -hmm. any other option, but they'll have the real understanding of, of how these systems are working. And, and as I say, it's, it's not sustainable. We hope, that, we, hope, we hope that they have an understanding after this, but I will promise you this, I will take that information and I will keep spreading the word and yeah. talking to the legislature about it. I, I absolutely appreciate all the work that you guys do. I know I've gone through and, and, and looked at previous um, papers that you've written and the blogs that you've written, and I find them to be extremely helpful when I'm when I'm trying to advocate on behalf of county government and the legislature. So, for that, I say thank you very much, and thanks for participating on the podcast today. It was my pleasure. All right, thanks great. We're going to have you. We're going to have you back again. Great. So just be ready. All right. Thank you, Eric. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Podcast 83, brought to you by the Michigan Association of Counties. 